everyone and welcome to the latest Genome Giants interview. Today we are going to be talking to a legendary scientist, it's Leroy Hood, who will be taking us through his career and also his motivations as well. So before we get stuck into it, Lee, if you could just introduce yourself and tell everyone a little bit about what you do as well. Uh, I'm Lee Hood. Uh, I'm at the Institute for Systems Biology and I'm just starting a new nonprofit called Phenome Health, which is all about uh, precision population health. I suspect we'll talk about that later. I think my main passion in life is uh, science reading and exercise. So with that, I think we can get started. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> so you were born in Montana in 1938. What are some of your fondest memories growing up? Oh, uh, growing up in Montana was absolutely wonderful. I had parents that uh, gave me enormous freedom to do what I wanted to do. So I was running around the mountains of uh, southwestern Montana when I was five and six years old. I uh, had uh, some of the best teachers I've ever had in my life during high school. They were enormously formative uh, for me as a person and, and uh, for the career path that I eventually end up choosing. Choosing, But I, I think Montana is an exceptional place. It's small population. It's, uh, there's a lot of freedom. There's a lot of sense of independence and you can go out and do what you want to do. And I think those were all very important characteristics that were installed uh, before I ever started my educational trajectory or my career trajectory. Yeah. You're actually one of four children and your brother had Down syndrome. What was it like at the time for him growing up and, and how much did you understand at the time as well? Well, the, the Down syndrome birth of my brother, six years younger than myself, was uh, really an interesting experience. I remember asking the doctor, um, what causes this? And he said, I have no idea whatsoever. And of course, we didn't discover chromosomes and chromosomal abnormalities until much later. It evoked an enormous debate in my family. My mother wanted to keep uh, Glenn as uh, her own child and, <clears throat> and raise him. And my father said, it would be very much for him to go to the better to go to the state institution where they have professional people that know how to deal with Down syndrome. And uh, as usual, my uh, father won in these arguments. And I have to say in retrospect, I think he was correct because my brother Glenn did go to state school. It was a great experience for him. And, and by the time he was finished, he had three jobs. He owned a small house. He was subletting to other Down uh, syndrome uh, colleagues. And, and I think he lived a wonderful full life that would have been very impossible to, to live in Missoula, Montana or Shelby, Montana. So in, in retrospect, uh, I mean, I'm sure he was an exceptional uh, Downs uh, patient and everything, but that really was the first time I kind of asked the why question. And, and it clearly pointed towards science, although I can't say I had any deep insights or anything. Yeah. What were you like as, as a child? And, and when did you actually first kind of start to think that, oh, I might like be interested in science? Well, uh, you know, I think I was... Uh, a little bundle of energy. I love to hike and climb and run around. And, uh, and I was curious and I did a lot of reading. And uh, I think the first transformative experience for me in science was in the sixth grade when Mr. Graham, my math teacher, who, who I adored, he was a terrific math teacher, uh, approached me and said, I understand you want to be a pilot. And I said, that's right. And uh, it, it, he said, you know, Lee, I flew B-52s during World War II in Indonesia. And I can honestly tell you, uh, flying a plane is like driving a truck. He said, do you want to spend your life driving a truck? 
And that turned me around. And he went on to say, look, you should go into science. That's, that's, and, and it didn't propel me immediately, but instantaneously, I was no longer wanting to be a pilot. And I was thinking in a broader context. Yeah. You did your um, undergraduate education at Caltech. What did you, what did you study in? And what was your experience like at Caltech as well? Well, you know, before we get to Caltech, let me tell you that one of these superb teachers, uh, 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 Mr. Shockey, was uh, a World War, II, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Cliff Olson was a World War II navigator who went to Caltech to learn navigational skills. And he decided that he would uh, take and persuade any good students he had to go to Caltech because he thought so much of what he saw there. So my junior year, uh, 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 Cliff Olson approached me. He was my chemistry teacher. And he said, look, next year, would you help me teach biology to the sophomores? And I said, I'd do it if, uh, if I could use Scientific American to teach from. And he said, OK. So I went and ended up giving uh, a lecture on uh, a series of lectures, probably 10 in the course on various topics in Scientific American. But the one that absolutely transformed me, and this was 1956, I, I taught a lecture on the structure of DNA just three years after it was discovered. And I remember thinking, this is an incredible molecule. And if it's the center of biology, that's where I'd like to go. And at that same time, Cliff came to me and he said, well, if that's what you want to do, you should go to Caltech. And I said, what's Caltech? And he said, it's, it's a very famous technical school where you can learn deeply about science. And I went and looked up the requirements for Caltech. And I said, gee, you know, you have to take the advanced math test to get into Caltech. And it's all about calculus. And I haven't had calculus. And he said, ah, don't worry about it. He said, just take the test, you'll do fine. You know, today we would have gone out and you'd have read a book and you'd learned calculus in the month or two and all of that kind of thing. That wasn't how it was in those days. So, so anyway, I, where I really wanted to go was uh, Carleton in Northfield, Minnesota, because it was a small liberal arts school and I loved kind of everything I'd read about it. And, and anyway, I took the advanced math test. I'm quite confident I got one of the lowest scores of anybody that ever gotten into to math. And in fact, I had one of my teachers in later years tell me that, uh, that uh, my math score led them to predict that I would be at the bottom of the class. But anyway, I got in and uh, ended up going to Caltech rather than to Carleton. And it was wonderful because it gave me all the basic tools I needed for science. I mean, lots of math and lots of chemistry and lots of physics. And, and besides, I had two of the most inspirational teachers I've ever had there. So one was Linus Pauling. He wasn't then at Caltech, but he came back and gave uh, freshman uh, chemistry lectures. And the other was Richard Feynman. And I was in his freshman class as he was writing this classic trilogy of physics books. So he experimented with us in all sorts of ways. And, and both of them were enormously charismatic. They believe that you teach in simple, easily understandable ways. And, and they were kind of infinitely uh, aspirational. And those, they set the standards for how I thought teaching should be. And that's what I aspired to. I can't claim I came close to any of that, but it was, they were wonderful models for thinking about how to communicate to people. It was even broader than just uh, uh, teaching courses. But Caltech, I got to play football. I played football in high school and been a quarterback and our team had been undefeated my last three and a half years and he'd won state championships. And so at Caltech, you know, I mean, it was, 
my high school football team would have destroyed Caltech's football team. <laughs> there is no question. But it was a chance to get out and get exercise and do something besides uh, study all the time. And I sang in the chorus. And so I did a, I was a class president. One of, so I did a lot of different things. And Caltech was just a terrific experience for me. I took a lot of humanities because I always felt having a grounding in uh, culture and history is, is uh, it's a, a really important context for communication and thinking about teaching too. So anyway, Caltech was all good, except for one thing. And I had decided partly as a result of my brother and a whole series of things, I was really interested in human biology, but we had almost no higher organism biology at Caltech. I learned about microbes and I learned about uh, uh, cell lines and all sorts of different things, but I didn't learn about people. So I decided since I really was interested in studying human biology and later human disease, that I had to go to medical school. And uh, so I uh, talked with all of the faculty about where I should apply. So I only applied two places, Harvard and Johns Hopkins. And then, then it was a big debate and different faculty members had very different motivations and, and arguments. But what really convinced me to go to Hopkins was if you wanted to do something that was non-traditional in medicine, and I never wanted to practice, I wanted to get the background so I could go back and get a PhD and learn how to do research. And then I was going to do human biology research. So uh, they had an accelerated program where if you went in the summers, you could get done in a little less than three years. So I chose Hopkins and I got done in, in uh, three years. So that's, uh, but Caltech was just a wonderful first step into science. You returned to Caltech after John Hopkins and you did your PhD there as well. Why did you kind of decide to go back and, and what did your PhD actually focus on in, in the end? Well, you know, I looked at, well, three or four places seriously. I looked at Stanford very seriously. I did look at Harvard Biochemistry and uh, in the medical school. Uh, and, and I looked at the University of Colorado Microbiology, and they all had really attractive features. But what really convinced me about Caltech was it had a real technology bent. And I was convinced even then, before I'd started doing all this technology, that, that a part of the solution to human biology was going to be able to make measurements faster, better, cheaper, those kind of things. And Caltech seemed to have the grounding in excellent engineering and chemistry for doing just that kind of thing. So I, in fact, I remember going to the chairman of biology and saying, look, Bob Sinsheimer was his name. He was really a great scientist. And I said, look, Bob, Stanford has offered me 20,000 and you have only offered me 15,000 a year. Do you think we could make any modifications? And Bob Sinchheimer said, no, plea. I think you're just gonna have to make a decision. So anyway, that was, that was Caltech. And I started at $15,000 a year and it was an absolutely wonderful place again for me to grow up in science for lots of reasons. I will say before that though, at Hopkins, I, I again had a wonderful experience. And frankly, I got interested in almost all the things, uh, cancer in uh, immunology, the immune system uh, in, <clears throat> in, in biochemistry and then maybe the very beginnings of molecular biology there. And those were the things that carried me through in the future. But again, I had one absolutely outstanding teacher. Uh, Barry Wood Jr. was uh, Harvard's last All-American football player. He played quarterback and that resonated with me and we talked about football. But he started as a young, 
uh, clinician being the youngest chairman of a department of medicine at Washington University in St. Louis. And he, he built a spectacular department there. And then he decided he wanted to go into basic science. So he came uh, to Hopkins and was chair of microbiology. And, and a, a one interesting side experience is Barry came to me my senior year and he said, you know, I've decided to offer you an assistant professorship in my department of microbiology. It will accelerate your career enormously and, and get you into the heart of science. And it was one of the hardest things I ever had to turn down. I said, no, I was convinced I needed to go back and get a PhD and really learn how to do science. And then I was, I felt I'd really be set up to, to do. So I ended up looking at Harvard and Stanford and Caltech and going back to Caltech. So after your PhD, what was your kind of early career like and what were some of the earlier challenges that you faced during that period? Well, you know, I had a spectacular career as a graduate student because I, I chose to go into molecular immunology. And when I'd been at Johns Hopkins, I started reading papers about this uh, NIH investigator that was studying uh, plasma cell tumors in mice where you could obtain homogeneous antibodies to characterize them. And I was very interested in how the body could generate this diversity of antibodies to protect us. And I thought these myeloma tumor proteins would be an ideal way to study that. And ironically, when I went to Caltech as a first year graduate student, Bill Dreyer came as a new faculty member. So I immediately went to him and said, look, I'm really interested in this. His main project then was completely different. So he said, that's terrific, Lee. This is a good Saturday afternoon project where you can work on it and you can do it at your own leisure and you don't have to worry about competition. So I was really excited and I learned how to make these plasma cell tumors and mice, and I learned how to purify the antibodies, and I learned how to do uh, manual protein sequencing. And, you know, my first year, I had some absolutely spectacular results. And in my sophomore year, I was giving lectures at Berkeley and UCSD. So I was in the fast track as a graduate student and really stayed there the whole time. It, it was just the most wonderful uh, start to my career. And, uh, uh, and you know, it was, uh, my, my mentor was not a hands-on person, but he was a great theoretical person. And we used to have really fascinating conversations. And uh, over the, those years I was with him, he really taught me two things that, that guided my career. He said, look, if you want to do biology, be at the leading edge. He said, don't be a librarian, just doing what people have already done before in more detail. He said, go out and carve out your frontier and, and, and set the pace. And so I did that in molecular immunology, and it was really an exciting 20, 25 years of my career. I followed all the way through from characterizing proteins, getting into molecular biology and isolating the genes for all the immune receptor families, discovering all sorts of things. It was great. I mean, uh, back at NIH and then back as a faculty member at uh, Caltech. But the second thing he said to me really had a big impact on me too. And that was, if you really want to change the field, envelop invent a relevant technology that can give you a new window into its biology. And, you know, and, and Bill Dreyer did that in uh, several instances. He was one of the first that saw the power of fluorescent antibodies. He was one of the first that pushed the uh, then classic method for doing uh, quantitative analysis of amino acids and everything. So anyway, he was uh, a mentor that wasn't interested in hands-on, but he was really interested in theory and he was terrific for me. 
I mean, you yourself have been involved in the development of some groundbreaking instruments, and I've had to write them down because it's a long list. So these include a DNA synthesizer, a peptide synthesizer, the first automated DNA sequencer, an inkjet oligonucleotide technology, and nanostring technology. And I got one more. <laughs> You forgot automated oh, nice. protein sequencing, uh, which is the first instrument I worked on, actually. How? How? <laughs> what was that kind of, what has that kind of, that whole journey kind of been like for you? And how have the kind of skills that you developed early on kind of helped you with those developments? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, when I went back to Caltech again, I had uh, a firm a whole, uh, a handle on molecular immunology, and that's what I was going to do. I'd, I'd really gotten into protein chemistry very deeply, and I wanted to be able to actually make it hundreds of times more sensitive than it was at that time, because there are a lot of really interesting proteins that are available in small amounts. And I saw that if we could... Uh, increase two or 300 fold the sensitivity of sequencing, we could transform fields. But I, I also thought that, I mean, once you add the amino acid sequence, in principle, if you could synthesize DNA probes easily, you could make probes to clone the gene, characterize it, and if you could sequence the gene. So that thinking, that, that speculation about a microchemical facility got me thinking about the first four uh, instruments that I uh, was really interested in. So immediately uh, at Caltech, I set off on a trajectory of what I call paradigm changes. And they were all focused on dealing with human complexity, but they really revealed what I wanted to do with human biology and, and how I felt we should study uh, human disease. And, and the first of these paradigm changes was basically bringing engineering to biology. And, you know, that was not a popular thing to do at Caltech. I was three years into my tenure at Caltech, and Bob Sinsheimer, my chairman there, came to me and he said, you know, Lee, I advise you in the strongest possible terms to give up all of this technology development because he said, you should focus on your biology. And I said, Bob, I'm doing just fine with my biology and this technology is really gonna change the world. And I said, no, I wouldn't give it up. And uh, I found 20 years later that the reason he came to me is the senior faculty at Caltech felt uh, two things. One, they felt engineering and biology was inappropriate. They wanted to move me to uh, the engineering department. And Bob said, at least I didn't ask you to do that. I agreed with them. But the second thing is I, I had to make my lab very large because I needed expertise in chemistry and physics and computer science and engineering. And so I had a lot of people in my lab. Caltech was a traditional small science lab where your lab shouldn't get bigger than 10 people. And it, you know, at one time doing both molecular immunology and then I got into neurobiology and doing all this technology development, I had a lab with more than 65 people. And that kind of that that just didn't sit well at Caltech. And uh, I think they never forgave me for it. But uh, anyway, I mean, it's part of a later story. But I went to the Department of Biology and said, look, I have a solution for this. Why don't I start an applied biology department where we have faculty members that are all across disciplinary talents I need and I can keep my lab focused on biology and the, and the chemistry and engineering I'm doing. And they absolutely rejected that idea. And I'm sure it was, they were worried it would be very competitive with biology, which it absolutely would have, no question. I will say everyone else at Caltech, the engineers, uh, the chemists, uh, and so forth, physicists were utterly different, but uh, it, they thought it was a great idea. And uh, anyway, we can come back to that later. But so this technology really drove this first paradigm change. 
and, and it was important in really two ways for me. One, we could really generate a lot of data on individuals and generating data and being able to analyze it was the first step in dealing with human complexity. And, and the second thing that happened that really transformed my life is in the spring of 1985, I got invited to Santa Cruz with 11 other scientists to consider whether the Human Genome Project was a good or a bad thing. And uh, I got invited because I was developing automated DNA sequencing, and that was essential for this project. And, and so we came to two interesting conclusions. One was um, that it was technically feasible, although at that time, really hard. And the second was we were split six to six on whether it was a good idea. And those against it argued against it because it was big science and big science would swoop in and swallow up all small science. And biology at that time was all small science. So people were really terrified of a big project like this. And indeed in the, the, the last five years of the eighties, when I went out into the biology community advocating for the Human Genome Project, I think initially 80% or more of the people were absolutely opposed and NIH was utterly opposed. And they argued, we don't need it because we're putting $300 million into genetics a year. And uh, genetics is better than genomics. And of course, they're apples and oranges. They're not related. You can't make comparisons like that. And you can't do with genetics what you can do with genomics. And you can't do with genomics. Well, that's not quite true. There are ways you can do a lot of genetics with genomics. But anyway, it was an enormous controversy for four years until a National Academy committee, which I was on, uh, that had opponents and proponents, ended up universally endorsing it and saying, this is a unique opportunity, we have to do it. And then NIH turned around in the microseconds and, and they played an important role in, uh, obviously, the development of the Human Genome Project. But the real hero in the early days was the Department of Energy, because it pioneered in those uh, late 80s when NIH was against it, and it gave it a legitimacy that allowed us to go to Congress and raise uh, a little more than $3 billion over a 10-year period to do it. And without DOE behind it, that would never have happened. So, What has it been like for you kind of watching the project like play out because obviously you, you were there at the first meeting and now obviously it's it's been sequenced How, what has that been like for you watching it all happen well unfold? the genome was one big step and we can talk later about the final step that i'm taking now which i think will be the real common culmination but what, what the genome did what really excited me about the genome look there were a lot of things a, it transformed virtually every field of biology because you could get the genomes of all these organisms and you could do science in different ways and it transformed molecular evolution in a major way. But what I loved was it gave you access to human genetic variability and to correlate it with wellness and disease phenotypes. And that's, those are very powerful tools. And how do you think kind of the sequencing field has evolved and, and what do you kind of see happening in the future as well? Well, look, uh, the sequencing field has had three giant steps, the automated DNA sequencing field. Look, the first giant step was Sanger inventing how you do dideoxy sequencing and that really enabled its uh, automation. and. Uh, I mean, an interesting story is we started out trying to automate the alternative Maxim Gilbert sequencing and really failed for reasons that are totally obvious now. But when we switched to dideoxy, it went beautifully and we were able in three years to develop a, uh, a prototype instrument. But, um, you know, I think what really excited me about the genome project is th that you could do big science. You could put together large amount of money and you could push the technology. You could push the computational tools. You could push 
the sequencing technologies. And of course, what the Genome Project did was catalyze the initiation of seven orders of magnitude uh, decrease in cost and uh, increase in throughput at DNA sequencing. So the first automated uh, DNA sequencer was the one we invented the, uh, that did classic Sanger sequencing. And the second stage of DNA sequencing was something that really George Church, Church pioneered when he essentially paralyzed sequencing so you could do a million sequences at once, although they had to be very short reads. So that second generation, uh, highly parallel short read sequencing, and that's what dominates today. And uh, maybe uh, 10 years ago, the third field started to emerge, which is single cell, uh, single molecule sequencing. And there are uh, instruments out there that can do it beautifully. But in the future, the advantage of single molecule sequencing is you can get very, very long sequencing reads. So as we do each human genome, you'll have all the information you need to, to assemble that genome independently of any other uh, imperfect comparisons. So I think the, the third and final generation is going to be uh, really uh, this single molecule sequencing. And I think the cost of sequencing, I can see the cost of sequencing coming down to 10 to $20 uh, a whole genome sequence done. I can see the throughput uh, increasing to whatever you want to increase it to. So it'll be, and, 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 and you'll be able to very automatically go from the data to a fully assembled sequence that's quite accurate for each individual. So anyway, that's how I see sequencing evolve. But you know, in technology, nothing has been more impressive than the 10 to the sixth or 10 to the seventh uh, uh, decrease in cost of sequencing and uh, increase in throughput and so forth. It's, it's really been spectacular. And in fact, what we need to do is really push the same kind of transformational technologies with protein analysis and metabolite analysis and lipid and all, all of the other molecules that are really important to analyze in the future. Yeah. As you were, we were kind of talking about earlier, in, in 1992, you um, founded the first cross-disciplinary um, biology department in uh, University of Washington. How did you manage to convince them to set up this department? Well, um, it was really an interesting story. I mean, increasingly, my colleagues at Caltech, the faculty members in biology, were unhappy about two things I was doing. One was uh, all this technology, and the second was the genome project. They were really quite negative on it. Uh, so, you know, I thought to myself, science is really about having fun and enjoying your colleagues and not being harped at and criticized all the time. And I said, gee, you know, Caltech is just not a good place for me anymore. It was a wonderful place to grow up. It's a, it's a terrific institution, but, you know, in a sense, as David Baltimore said, I just outgrew Caltech and I wanted to do bigger things than they were comfortable with. So I started going around and I went to Berkeley and I got a job offer there, but you know, the Berkeley biology faculty took a vote of confidence and, and two thirds of them were against my coming. And uh, I mean, no, one third, two thirds wanted me one third. And I thought, yeah, this, I don't want to get back into this again. And one of my former students, Roger Perlmutter, who is just a spectacular student, and he, he went up to the University of Washington after he did his postdoc with me and immediately got a faculty position and later was chairman of immunology there. He said, why don't you come up and uh, look at the University of Washington? And he said, we'll see if we can get Bill Gates interested. So they invited me to come up and give three lectures in a series called the Dance Lectures about the future of biotechnology, which I did. Bill went to all three of these lectures and we had a dinner 
uh, atop the Columbia Towers at the end of my lecture. And we, we talked for, gosh, two or three hours. Uh, it was it was an absolutely fast, fascinating conversation. Bill is, is uh, it, it obviously one of the brightest people I've ever met. And he loved biology. And he's interested about all the details. So... And finally, he said, well, look, uh, I'll help you come up here. Why don't you think about coming up and doing some of these kind of things? So he offered to put uh, 12 million, which in 1992 was a fair sum of money, into an endowment to get me to come up. And, uh, and he talked with the dean. I mean, and that was an interesting story on my first visit to Seattle. Uh, and I thought it was successful. I gave a lecture. I talked to a lot of faculty. And my final conversation with the dean, he said, you know, Lee, I don't think we're a good fit for you because this is way too fancy for us. Medical schools aren't so technologically oriented. And it, that was really a downer because I kind of convinced Bill. I thought, well, okay, that's life. And uh, I went back on a Friday and the dean called me on a Monday and said, look, I've really made a big mistake. I'd like to come down and spend a day with you and convince you, A, that I understand the mistake I made and that I want you to come and this is a good place. So he came down and we spent a day and we agreed I would do what I wanted to do. And, uh, and I mean, and he was such a wonderful dean and I was excited about working under him because he was a real scientist and he other understood biology and he understood science in a way the next dean never understood it. So anyway, I came up and, and uh, he, he was a terrific chair and I got to do all these things and my department was enormously successful in developing all sorts of different technologies, but um, <clears throat> Toward the uh, end of this uh, eight-year tenure in this department, uh, this dean was a big trekker, and he went on a trekking hike with his wife and Sherpas in the Himalayas and uh, got caught in uh, a storm and an avalanche, and he died there. And then uh, we had a new dean camp come up who was uh, a more classic uh, outcomes clinician, and and he saw the world very differently than I saw the world. And I could see the right handwriting on the wall. So, uh, I, so in, in 2000, I decided, look, um, I'd wanted to build systems biology on top of this cross-disciplinary department. And I decided for lots of reasons that was gonna really be hard at the university. So I resigned and started the Institute of Systems Biology. You're actually credited with introducing the term systems biology. How did this kind of come about? And then what was that journey like to actually setting up the Institute of Systems Biology? Well, you know, I was thinking in the late 80s about how you integrate all these data together in the systems. And it, it wasn't, they weren't very coherent thoughts of that type, but at least I was beginning to probe it. And, uh, and, and then, uh, I even wrote a couple of grants to NSF, which never got funded. I mean, I didn't quite understand how to do systems biology at that time. And I don't think any of the reviewers even understood what I was talking about. But in, in the 90s, then I saw moving to Seattle would be the chance to really build upon this new thing. And with all the technology we developed, it was becoming obvious that one approach that was very powerful to systems biology was to generate a lot of information on an organism and then be able to convert that information into biological networks that were then just beginning to emerge, mostly through protein-protein interactions. And, and that was really the mantra that we started with uh, uh, in systems biology, and it worked absolutely beautifully. And so we did a lot of classic biology, and, and uh, we looked at uh, galactose system and yeast and were able to do the dynamics of how the system changed once you initiated 
its ability to metabolize yeast. We could look at all the systems, see how they changed. And we had a classic paper in science on, on that approach. And it, one thing after another led to success. And then systems biology is now a world. Everybody's doing systems biology. They each have their own different brand, but it's making people think in global, holistic, and integrative kind of ways. And that's good in biology, because if you don't do that, it's so complicated, it's going to be hard to get anywhere. Yeah. How do you think this field, since its kind of inception, has, has evolved, and how do you think it will continue to evolve as well? Oh, I think it's evolved by bringing in all sorts of new technologies. See, what, what we what we really stressed in the beginning and people are just now becoming to realize is that what you need to learn systems is to study the dynamics and see how the system changes. That's the only way you get clues to it. And what I've seen is that has been adopted and new technologies that are revolutionary have been adapted. I mean, imaging technologies that can let you see the brain down at the molecular level and how it's changing, or a small organism like the zebrafish, looking at different organs and seeing what's going on with regard to metabolism. So we, we've gained the tools, we've gained the insights of uh, dynamics, and we've developed very powerful computational tools for analysis, uh, integration, uh, visualization, and for creating computational models that you can hone to approach reality that then can make very powerful predictions. And, and one example of this is a technology called di digital twins that's being used for human diseases in very striking ways, cancer and uh, Alzheimer's. So the field has evolved spectacularly well. And, uh, you know, it's it, anybody, <clears throat> it, it's like molecular biology was 25 years ago. Molecular biology was an enormous leap up from bi simple biochemistry. And, and uh, systems biology, uses all the tools of molecular biology, but it brings the integrative and dynamic view that makes it a reality of translating complexity. One of the things that you're currently working on, which you, you mentioned earlier, is the Phenome Project. What exactly is this project and, and how did this, this project come about as well? Well, uh, in the... Uh, in, in the mid-teens, about uh, 2014, I decided we developed enough technologies, we and others had developed enough technologies that we could begin to look at human populations and for each individual get a lot of data and make predictions about wellness and disease. And uh, I started a pilot project on this in 2014, where I persuaded 108 of my friends to submit over basically a year or two, uh, three different uh, kinds of analyses where we looked at uh, 1,200 blood analytes, proteins, metabolites, clinical chemistries. We did the gut microbiome. We used a Fitbit for digital self and, and blood pressure measurements and other kinds of things like that. And we did the whole genome sequence of each of them. And we developed the tools then to begin integrating these data together. And from these data analysis and integration came a whole series of what we call actionable possibilities. That is, these were possibilities that an individual could do. Uh, and if doing them, uh, if they did them, they would either improve wellness or avoid disease. And we over a period of a year, <clears throat> generated uh, probably 50, 60 of these. And each individual was different in what they needed and what they had to do. But it, it really validated what we call uh, quantitative or, or scientific wellness, as opposed to just diet, sleep, and uh, exercise. And those are important. And they were a part of what we did. But more, it was bringing appropriate equilibrium to the blood because they assessed all your organs so you could 
fine tune many different things from the blood and, and looking at your gut microbiome because it has an enormous influence on the brain and many other things we're just beginning to understand. So this program was successful. We started a company called Airvail that over a four year period gathered together 5,000 clients uh, to bring them scientific wellness. And we created during that time, these longitudinal data clouds. So we did their genome again, and then we did what we call the phenome analysis. That's, that's all the other measurements beside the genome, basically. And again, the Airvale program pushed us up to more than 200 actionable possibilities for wellness and, and, and people loved it. It wasn't financially stable. We really needed to bring in doctors. Those were the two major changes that had us shut it down in 2019. But from those data, we learned, we validated scientific aging. We learned how to make a metric for wellness and, and that the younger you are in your biological age, the better you're aging. And, and so now we have a metric we can use to assess people and how well scientific wellness is doing. So anyway, when Arafail failed, I got asked to come in 2017 and become the chief science officer at Providence St. Joseph's where I've been for the past five years. And I started this big project, which we've now come be called Beyond the Human Genome Project. And the idea is to increase over Arafail's 5,000 individuals by 200 fold and do the same thing for a million people uh, over a period of uh, 10 years. And again, we would bring in scientific wellness, we would bring in healthy aging. We, we, we've been able to demonstrate that you can calculate genetic risk for almost a hundred different diseases. And knowing that if you're at high risk for uh, particular diseases, we can follow you and catch the earliest transitions and reverse them. But most interesting, we were able to show that over the four year period of these 5,000 people in Aravel, we saw 167 transitions from wellness to disease and included all the chronic diseases. So we took uh, uh, 10 of the transitions to cancer and we looked at bloods drawn prior to the clinical diagnosis and showed we could up to five years prior to the clinical diagnosis have markers that said you've transitioned this disease. So we're gonna use those to reverse the disease at the early stage and prevent you from ever getting the disease. So what this uh, Beyond the Human Genome Project is all about is the science of wellness and the science of prevention. And it is a classic example of P4 medicine. It's predictive, preventive, and personalized. And that's the science. We know how to do the science. But the fourth P is participatory and getting people to do what's good for themselves, getting physicians to uh, accept this new kind of medicine, having healthcare leaders buy into it, that all requires a type of participation that we're just learning how to do. And that's going to be, that's going to be the biggest challenge in this program. But just as with the first Human Genome Project, I'm approaching the US government for federal funding uh, to support this project. And I believe at the end of this project, we'll really have honed how we can follow and optimize the health trajectory for every individual and essentially help you ever from ever transitioning into clinical disease. We'll reverse these things before you get the diseases. So that's the, the essence of the project and it'll keep me busy for the next uh, 10 years or more. You've had such a big career. Like, How have you maintained a passion for science? And were there ever any occasions where you thought, oh, I can't be bothered to do this like anymore. I want to quit. <laughs> well, anyway, so my biological age is 15 years younger than my chronologic age. And I really attribute that to 
I do a lot of exercise. I think exercise is a really important element of, uh, of biological age, but I do reasonable dieting. I, uh, I, I try and manage my sleep and, um, you know, I do, I love to travel and uh, I'm really excited. Actually, I'll be coming to London uh, probably in less than a month to visit some people and see some place over there. And I love to read. So, uh, and, and, and I followed my mentor's advice. I'm always at the leading edge and I'm always excited both at the opportunities and especially the challenges. And let me tell you, there are a lot of challenges in a project. If I thought the genome project had challenges, this really has challenges. But, you know, they're just exactly what you need to get your blood flowing. So anyway, I, I think this project will keep me going uh, well into my 90s. So it's going to be an exciting time. Definitely. Were there any kind of major missteps throughout your career that, that you learned from um, and obviously applied like later on in your career? Well, I, I don't know if it's a misstep, but I do ask myself the question, you know, I left Caltech because I couldn't persuade people that what I was doing was good. And I ask myself, could I have spent more time persuading them could I have been more persuasive with them? And uh, I don't know, it's hard to say. And again, when I left the University of Washington, um, it, it was, uh, uh, you know, it, again, it was very impetuous because uh, I had frankly several clashes with this Dean and I just decided life was too short to to go through these things, both for him and me, be better if I left. And so uh, I did leave. And again, I wonder whether that could have been managed better. But I'll tell you, the most regenerative part of your career is when you have the courage to do something new in a different environment, because it turns on everything in solving hundreds of problems you never, ever even imagined existed. And it gets you into different levels of science as I progress through. So, so I think the challenges are every bit as important as the opportunities. And, you know, if I had to give advice to people, I'd say every 10 or 15 years, change your career in a major direction. And all of a sudden you'll find yourself insecure, learning a ton of new stuff, uh, opening, using all your past experience to think about the future in new and interesting ways. Uh, those are the times when you really grow. Yeah. I mean, outside of your career, you mentioned that you like exercise. What else do you, do you like to do? That's not science. <laughs> That's not science. Well, I, I, for a lot of my time did mountaineering. I was a really good rock climber. I climbed El Cap to give you an idea of uh, those kind of things. So I had an outdoor life that was very active. I've hiked every single subsidiary of the major part of the Grand Canyon. And that's really mountaineering because a lot of them don't have trails and you have to figure out how to get down cliffs that are very dangerous because they're shale and crumbly and things like that. But it, it was, so, so I like challenges there too. I do that less now, but I, I love hiking and, uh, and, and walking and things like that still. My wife made me give up technical climbing, uh, oh, 15 years ago. She said, look, you're really in good shape, but you, don't, you can't do the things you did when you were earlier. Absolutely true. So, <laughs> uh, if you okay. could... Um... If I was going to say, if you could turn your career into a film or a book, what would you call the title? What would the name of it be? Determined Optimism. I like that. Why would you call it that? <laughs> because in every new paradigm change you take, you run into enormous skepticism and criticism and even hostility. 
I mean, I remember giving a lecture at at, uh, at at Woods Hole, one of their Friday night lectures. These are big classic lectures given to the lay public. And I, it must have been about, oh, I don't know, 1987 or so. And I came in and gave this lecture on the Genome Project. And it was incredible. The first question I got asked was, you say automate this and automate that. Now I ask you, where is the humanity in your science? And it went downhill from there. And we had a vigorous argument that left. And, and I think almost everyone was against me. I mean, it was really. <laughs> and to show you how bad it was, I'd come with my suitcase and my host had brought me to the lecture and everything. And my host went home. And when I was finished with the last questions, I had to go to a janitor and say, do you know where speakers usually stay? And then wheel my thing up to uh, the hotel, which was three blocks away. Or, I mean, th that was a level of um, animosity, but, but you know, it didn't deter me in the slightest because I could see a future they couldn't see. And a few can see it now, but they can't see it very clearly yet. And that's what this, beyond the human genome project, the beyond is the longitudinal phenome. That's the next big step that's going to transform healthcare. Yeah. Thank you so much for talking to me today, Lee. You have, you've had an amazing career and you've got some amazing stories as well. So thank you so much for, for sharing that with me today. <laughs>